from WABE in Atlanta. Welcome to this Wednesday and very special edition of Closer Look. I'm Rose Scott. Let's go back. March 11th, 2020, the World Health Organization declares the coronavirus outbreak a global pandemic. Then a few days later, March 14th, Governor Brian Kemp right here in Georgia signs a public health state of emergency to address the virus. This declaration will greatly assist health and emergency management officials across Georgia by deploying all available resources for mitigation and treatment of COVID-19. If necessary, unlike other states of emergency, this declaration will allow the Department of Public Health to direct specific health care action in extraordinary circumstances. Wow, it may be hard to believe now 19 months later, the pandemic continues, but now there are vaccines and even booster shots. That's the good news, but there are still some ongoing challenges globally, nationwide, and depending on the state, a different set of issues. But what about Georgia's progress and some lingering challenges related to COVID-19? We're joining Closer Look, making his debut on the program, Georgia Governor Brian Kemp. Governor Kemp, thanks for taking the time. Welcome. Hey, Rose, good to be on with you. Appreciate it. We would be talking about the Georgia Bulldogs, but we're not going to do it this time. Next time, though, big game Saturday. All right, let's 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 begin here, Governor, because in that clip we played March 14th of last year, and you ended that press conference by saying, quote, we are in this fight together. Because of that, we will be, we will be stronger than ever, and may God continue to bless this great state and nation, close quote. What is your overall assessment of where the state is right now in combating this virus? Well, I'll tell you, when I was listening to you, to you go back on kind of the start of this whole thing, gosh, it seems like a decade ago in a, in a lot of ways. And it's been a very hard time for our state and for the nation, uh, but also people around the world. And I'm just so proud of Georgians of how resilient they've been. Uh, I think every family, every Georgian's been affected, obviously, by COVID. Um, the devastating effects it's had either on their family members and folks they know in the local community. And we just continue to plow through it every day. But we still have to keep uh, grinding away. It's been a grind and we're still grinding now. I also want to give you an opportunity for listeners who may not know about your decision making process. Who among the state agencies and departments were part of the decisions you would ultimately make regarding how the state would proceed through all of this? Well, listen, that's been, uh, I think, part of my approach is to try to be talking and listening and having conversations with a lot of different people, not just in state government. I mean, obviously, Dr. Toomey and her team at Public Health have been very involved, as well as the senior staff in the governor's office. But we've walked, worked with the Department of Community Health, our correction system, Department of Juvenile Justice, Department of Natural Resources, obviously, State Patrol, Georgia National Guard. I mean, there's been agency after agency has been involved, but as we've made decisions, we've also been working with the private sector. Uh, I've had great communication with uh, our hospital CEOs and our hospital institutions around the state, our schools as well, school leadership and others that are in um, the, that have to do with decision making at the local level. Uh, so, and, and as well as the legislature. So we've had a lot of folks we've been talking to, obviously other experts in, in the field of medicine and public health as well. Let's talk about one of the first major decisions you had to make, and that involves a shutdown. While many states had a shutdown for an extended period of time, you cited economic concerns when you reopened some businesses April 24th. And I want to ask you, that decision at any time, Governor Kemp, did you think about reconsidering this action? Did you have no, to go back and forth? Uh, no, I didn't. I mean, obviously, all these decisions you're making, whether it was that one or others, they're all tough decisions. I mean, we we're dealing with a global pandemic. You know, obviously, I had never done that. I don't think any other governor in the country has done that either. I know uh, the president at the time hadn't hadn't either. So we were all dealing with something that was new. And it was a moving target literally every single day. I mean, the first several, several months of the pandemic. We were working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, very grueling schedule because there were just so many fires we were having to, to put out. But, you know, one thing I've known for a long time being in business and uh, running a state agency myself is that you've got to get good information, get all the information you can get on both sides of the issue or any sides of the issues. 
But in these kind of times, you need leaders that will make tough decisions, and that's what I've done, not only with the reopening. And, you know, there was obviously a lot of national hysteria around that decision. But I, I will also say, you know, most people didn't realize, but we never shut most of the economy down to start with. So it was just a few segments of it that we reopened uh, because I felt like those industries and those hardworking Jordans had done what we asked them as a government at the national level and at the state level to help us build PPE supplies and hospital bed capacities and be able to prepare for what was coming. And it was time to reopen and, and do two things, protect lives, but also protect people's paycheck and their livelihoods. And I think our state has benefited greatly from that decision. So in other words, I want to be clear, you felt if there wasn't a continued shutdown for a long period of time, that would have been an economic disaster for the state? You well, feel I, feel like it, I feel like it would have been a disaster in a lot of ways. You know, a lot of the things that Dr. Toomey and I both warned about early on, uh, even outside of the, the economic um, circumstances that we surely would have faced as a state. But we talked about, you know, and not, not many in the media covered this. They're covering it now, though. They talked, you know, we talked about, you know, when kids aren't in school, the mental health issues that that creates when, you know, people are not getting enough physical exercise, when people, I mean, literally uh, the media did a great job of scaring people from going to the hospital um, at a time. When what do you mean by that? Take that well, further. Well, I'm saying the media was was writing so many scary things that scared people from actually making a decision to go get health treatments like cancer sent, uh, cancer treatments. You know, people would be uh, not going to, to get medical conditions checked out because they were simply scared of a virus that they knew so little about. And that's one reason when the second wave come, came, the media again said, oh, are you gonna shut down? I was being pressured to shut down again. I had people in the administration that were trying to get me to shut down again. And the hospital CEOs, uh, unbeknownst to anyone out there were saying, please don't shut down again. It almost bankrupt us the last time that we did that because it, it cuts their life, their financial lifeblood off. And that's the thing that unfortunately, uh, a lot of people wouldn't write about or, or you know, be on TV saying they're only highlighting the worst of the news that's out there. They're not highlighting all the other things and positive things that are going on or how safe it was to go into hospitals at that time because of the way they were handling and separating COVID patients from the rest of the populations that needed this care. And that's one reason you saw our hospitals extremely busy even in, even before the Delta wave came through. But you, but Governor, with all due respect, you say the media, or do you mean folks on social media? No, I mean the media, people on social media, literally scared people from going into the hospital because they just, you know, made it out to be so bad that, you know, you couldn't even walk out of your, your home without getting, getting COVID. And that was, you know, you, you could go back and look at press conference after press conference, Dr. Toomey and I both uh, were telling people and begging people, look, do not put off critical health procedures, or if you're feeling bad, you know, you should go to the doctor, you should go to the hospital, don't go because you're scared of the virus, they know how to deal with you. And that's well documented. Well, and I think that when that happens, I think you as the governor has every right to call out any credible or non credible media outlet that does that news media outlet. And I'm going to say this because here at WABE, I know we did not do that. And here on this program, I know we did not do that. But I want to talk about the criticism because even then, well, President Donald Trump, hold on one second, even then, President Donald Trump criticized you. How did you deal with that? Because look, Governor, there were tweets calling you hashtag killer Kemp and hashtag Kemp kills. You got the president criticizing you. What's going through your mind then? Well, you know, that, that's what you deal with when you're governor. It was pandemic politics and full display. You know, there was a lot of members of the uh, the Democrats in the legislature that were doing the same thing, and they did that every time there was a wave. They played pandemic politics. You'd have to ask them why they were criticizing me. I don't, I don't really have time to sit around here and worry about who's criticizing me. I'm making good decisions in conjunction, like I've said, with Dr. Toomey and uh, a lot of other hardworking people. And I think if you look back, you know, our, our COVID numbers have held up. Uh, as good as any other state in the country, you know, within a, a, a small certificate, you know, margin of difference and our mm -hmm. economic prosperity is as good as anybody in the country right now. 
If you're just joining us, I'm in conversation with Georgia Governor Brian Kemp, and we're taking a look back to the present and the future as Georgia is responding to the coronavirus pandemic here. Well, let's fast forward a little bit, because I do want to talk about then local governments and your relationship with them. Do you have any regrets about maybe having a better holistic approach to working with local governments as opposed to, let's say, city of Atlanta? and threatening lawsuits and, and all that, because at the end of the day, it is about saving lives. And also you mentioned the economic component as well, but you look at a city like Atlanta and Fulton County, which has a high percentage of a high risk population. You look at Hall County, who can you understand local governments wanting to say, hey, we need to protect our citizens, our residents, based on how this virus is attacking our folks, and maybe we would have, would like a little bit more help from the state as opposed to threatening with lawsuits and back and forth on Twitter and all that. And that's on both sides, Democrats, well, Republicans, well, everybody in between. Well, with all due respect, we gave a lot of help to local communities. Um, our, our Georgia Emergency Management Agency, which I haven't mentioned yet, the National Guard, we sent all kinds of people, all kinds of PPE supplies, ventilators to local hospitals. We set up uh, state purchased hospitals in local communities around the state, uh, state to make sure that they had additional bed center capacity. We stood up uh, a Georgia, uh, Georgia World Congress Center hospital facility. Uh, so when local communities were, you know, having a hard time with bed capacity, wherever it was in the state, that, that we had folks for people to have a bed. So to, to say that we didn't work with them is not true. Uh, no, I didn't I would, say you didn't would, work with them. Well, I said, I do you regret you back, your relationship, I would, though? I would point you back to early in the pandemic when you had local governments that were taking actions to shut things down. People were leaving and going to other places in our state to second homes. And I had those local governments saying, hey, you need to do a statewide order. We can't have this piecemeal, you know, one one city or one county's doing this and somebody else right next to them is doing that. We need a statewide order. That's what the, the mayors and a lot of the elected local elected officials want, uh, around the state wanted early in the pandemic. Well, I did that to make sure we had uh, continuity, if you will, around the state. Well, then when they didn't like the way I was doing things or things got better, then all of a sudden they wanted to have their local control back. And I would just tell you, you can't have it both ways. I tried to be very consistent. Uh, the media got it completely wrong again on the whole city of Atlanta issue. All they wrote about that it was a fight over mass mandates that had nothing to do with it. Uh, the mayor took action to violate my executive order to close businesses back down again, small businesses, restaurants and others uh, to not be able to do in-person dining. And if you look at the data, the outbreaks that we were seeing and our contact tracing did not show that infections were coming from outbreaks in restaurants or bars or anything else. We had great, great rules and regulations in place working with the private sector that had been working well. And that's what that lawsuit was all about. And I would remind you, there was only a few mayors around the state, Savannah and Atlanta, that did that. And if you look at the timing on much of that, it was all pandemic politics again. But pandemic politics, Governor, you know that politics, unfortunately, gets into a lot of things that it probably shouldn't. But again, at the end of the day, if we're talking about lives, if we're talking about specific populations that are at a higher risk for this virus, shouldn't those local governments be able to mandate, whether it's a, a level one, a level two, level three, level four, because they are concerned about the spread of that virus in their communities? Well, Rose, wouldn't you agree, though, that the local government shouldn't be able to take your economic viability away when there's no data that shows that, that they're a problem? I mean, you're going to ruin somebody financially. We've seen that in these other states where governors have done that. Literally generational businesses, many small businesses, and many in the city of Atlanta, I might add, are minority owned and have a large minority workforce. You know, I wasn't forcing people to be open. I wasn't forcing anyone to go dine there. I mm -hmm. was simply giving them the ability uh, to run their business and to keep a roof over their head, be able to buy food and medicine for their children. You know, the government wasn't forcing them to do that. What the mayor was doing was forcing them to close and ruin their business. And that was against the executive order. And that's why the lawsuit was filed. And you did, you did withdraw it because of 
here and we talk about Atlanta, you did withdraw that lawsuit. I, I'm assuming you and the mayor came to some agreement. That's all we can assume. But let's talk about then the vaccination rollout here in Georgia. And I heard Dr. Toomey talk about being surprised that in rural parts of Georgia, particularly rural white Georgians, weren't getting vaccinated. Should that have been a surprise, you think, given you just mentioned pandemic politics? Well, I don't think it was just, you know, rural white Georgians that weren't getting vaccinated. I mean, obviously there's vaccine hesitancy in the African-American community and other communities that are that out is true. there. But most of the rural, doctors. I'm talking about rural though. Let's focus on rural. Then we get into the minority population. Well, you mentioned when you asked the question, you said the vaccine rollout. So I'm, sure. I'm, I'm talking about the whole vaccine rollout. Of course, you know, part of the problem early in the pandemic was the federal government sent vaccines to the nursing homes. And a lot of the people working in the nursing homes um, that, you know, are seeing the front lines of COVID would not take the vaccination, you know, and I don't know what the makeup, um, the demographic or racial makeup of those employees are, um, but they're working in the healthcare industry. They're on the front lines of where the most, you know, the pandemic was most deadly early on and they, they chose not to get vaccinated. Um, that's one reason that we had so many uh, vaccines laying around in South Georgia because people down there wouldn't take them. Mm -hmm. And that's why we were one of the first states, if not the first state in the country, to open up the eligibility to folks that are medically fragile and people that were uh, essential workforce um, so that we could get people getting vaccinated. But, you know, vaccine hesitancy is not just a Georgia issue or a rural sure. Georgia issue. True. If you look all around the South, it's been that way and there's it's been that way in other parts of the country and you know i personally don't think mandates and pressing from the federal government then or now was the way to tackle that problem but that's what they've uh, certainly doing right now let's talk about that governor because right now and i'm looking at the georgia department of public health the vaccine dashboard looking at it right now in georgia by those who have at least one dose it's at 54 percent in terms of full vaccination, it's at 47%. What is an acceptable number for you, you think? Do you think Georgia can get to 50% at some point, at the end of the year, middle well, of next I, year? Yeah, I mean, my figures are showing that we got 54% of over 12 year olds uh, have had one dose and 64%, um, or maybe it's 64% have had one dose and 54. Um, or let me see, let me start over. I think 54% are fully vaccinated and 64% have had a full dose for over 12. But I, I'll, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Your figures may be, may be right. But I think one thing that people never mention when you talk about the vaccination rate, look, I'm vaccinated. My family's vaccinated. I have been on the front lines for a very long time encouraging people to get vaccinated, talk to their doctor. We did mass vaccination sites. We coordinated with the federal government on the, on the federal sites that they had in Georgia, especially Mercedes-Benz. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been working with local health departments. We've done pop-up sites. I mean, we're, we've got a, a, you know, a, a, a racial council that um, Dr. T or diversity council, I think is better is the correct name, that mm -hmm. Dr. Toomey put together to work on vaccine hesitancy in certain communities around the state. And I mean, I went to rural Georgia to get vaccinated myself to help you know, raise the, avail the, the, the viability of people getting vaccinated and, and continue to tell people, look, nobody trusts the government right now. When you have the president of the United States come out and say, get vaccinated, take your mask off. And now they're telling you to put it back on. Uh, when you have the vice president of the United States who under, pre when president Trump was in charge of the vaccine, said she wouldn't take the vaccine. And now she's encouraging people to do so. Those mixed messages build distrust uh, with a lot of people in our state and across the country. I think so that's a I'm, very valid point. What I'm telling said. people is, look, just talk to your doctor, you know, talk to your faith leader, talk to your local pharmacist, talk to people you trust. I mean, I have friends that are not getting vaccinated. I've had friends that, you know, have had terrible medical outcomes because they weren't vaccinated. People have lost their lives because they weren't vaccinated. Um, but it's not going to be the government, in my opinion, that's going to convince people to get vaccinated. In fact, it'll probably run a lot of people away that have that hesitancy. Um, so I think people should talk to their medical community uh, or their doctor about, about doing that. 
but I continue to encourage it. We, we're going to do everything that we can to continue to get people to get vaccinated. You know, we did the uh, state holiday and had a, uh, the largest day that month. I guess that was in uh, September when we did that. We had about 20,000 Georgians get their first dose that day. So, I mean, we're doing our part. Private industry and private business is doing their part. And certainly Dr. Toomey and her team continue to do their part, as well as a lot of people in private medicine. You're absolutely right because we've had folks on this program talk about mixed messaging and how problematic it's been. No one argues with that. I want to get into the schools though for a second, because as you know, and it, the local school district, depending on which one you go to, you're going to have a different set of protocols. Why not a mask mandate, Governor Kemp, for all the public school districts? Well, local schools have the local ability to do a mass mandate. You know, I've been working with a lot of school superintendents over the whole pandemic about when we close schools, how we're gonna reopen schools. We worked with them to get PPE supplies. We bought every school in the state uh, electrostatic sprayer and, and gave them chemicals to be able to clean those facilities. We've given, I don't know, hundreds of thousands, probably a million masks to schools mm -hmm. to help them reopen but every school's different rose you know and i've learned this over the years talking to the superintendents they want to have that ability uh, to deal with things on the local level um, i know this will find you shocking but people in different communities have different ways of thinking about how you should uh, handle that, the pandemic that, that's not a shock <laughs> and you know you know as well as i do we have a state constitutionally mandated school superintendent who's elected statewide like me we have local school boards that you know, actually, or, or the governing body for the local schools. And so I felt like it's best to allow them to have local control, especially as we open back up this year. You've had many systems that have, have done mass mandates. You've had others that added them. You had some that uh, did a mass mandate and people became so outraged two days later, they, in, they undid the mass mandate. Uh, so I don't think a one, one stop you know, one shop fits or one stop fits all approach here is the best way to go in schools. And we've allowed them to have that local control. Let's move to higher education real quickly, because I know we're short on time, but the State Department of Public Health is responsible for the contract tracing through Georgia's colleges and universities and the University System of Georgia. But Governor Kemp, I get emails. I'm hearing from students, professors who want to know, can you, with your authority, can you investigate, can you mandate that this contact tracing protocol is actually working? And I, I have this information. I can share it with you. We can, you know. Well, we'd be glad to take a look at the information. I have not heard that. Uh, Dr. Toomey's not raised that issue to me. You know, there gets to be a time uh, during these different bumps that we see in increases in cases where, you know, contact tracing begins to not be effective. You have so many people that are getting infected, you're better off. Uh, pushing the real solution to all of this, and that is getting people vaccinated uh, and really focusing on large outbreaks and things of that nature. But when you have such a high rate of spread as we've seen, not only uh, with the Delta variant, but other times throughout the pandemic, and every state has, but those are decisions that I leave up to Dr. Toomey. I mean, she's the one that's telling her team what they need to be focused on. She's mm -hmm. the, you know, the expert in doing all of this. She's done this her whole career. And, uh, you know, we are trusting to make trusting her to make those decisions. And if there's ever, you know, resources or anything else she needs, she knows that I'm a phone call away. As we wrap up, there's a question I've asked so many on this program about their optimism. And I'll ask you the same question. Where do you think Georgia will be maybe a year from now? Now, we know the coronavirus is not just going to magically disappear. We know that it's going to be with us. But where do you hope the state is a year from now? Well, I think we're going to be in a great position just because our people are so resilient. I want to thank everybody. Uh, I mean, look, a lot of these decisions are hard. I know a lot of people don't agree with some of the decisions I've made, but I can honestly tell you, I've tried to take all the information I can and make the best decision I can at the time. Uh, I've listened to a lot of people um, and gotten a lot of information when making those decisions. And I think because of that, a year from now, uh, we're going to be in a really good spot. I mean, I, I have no idea, you know, when this pandemic's going to turn into an epidemic and we kind of move on to fighting the flu and, a, and another, you know, seasonal virus every year. Uh, but we're going to keep our foot on the gas as long as we can and as long as we need to. 
Uh, but our economy is doing incredible because of our measured reopening. We've got great opportunity for, you know, every citizen in our state. We continue to stay focused on a lot of other issues now that the pandemic disrupted, you know, 15, 16 months ago, uh, whether it's public health, general health care, affordable health care, infrastructure, jobs, uh, making sure people are safe in our local communities, specifically in the city of Atlanta and just making sure we continue to be a great state to live, work, and raise our families. So I'm very optimistic about where we are and uh, really where we've been. It's, it's been a tough a time in our state, as a lot of people can remember for a lot of reasons, uh, but we've got to remain optimistic, and that's what I would tell uh, my fellow Georgians to do. And finally, Governor, you know the quote, adversity doesn't build character, it reveals it. What's been the takeaway for you about your leadership during this extraordinary time, these last 19 months. And again, to give you a final call on this, do you regret any decisions that you made that you would like to maybe take back? Well, I think looking back on the pandemics, it's hard to really question leaders and Monday morning quarterback when you're dealing with something that nobody's dealt with before. And even uh, a tremendous amount of public health experts, I would remind you, um, had outrageous models that we never even got close to uh, hitting the mark that they said early in the pandemic, and we still have it. And you don't hear a lot of people criticizing them, so I won't either. I would just tell people I'll let history be the judge of my decision-making process, and uh, obviously the voters will as well. Uh, but look, I want people to know I remain committed and grinding away every day. I mean, I get up at 5 o'clock every morning. I'm reading as much as I can about COVID and the economy and a lot of other things. And we're working hard every single day to keep our state moving forward. Our cases are going down again. Our hospitalizations have dropped dramatically. And so I feel like we're over this hump again, but we got to keep our foot on the gas and continue to people talk to people about getting vaccinated and, and getting the pandemic behind us and moving on to where we're not dealing uh, with such a deadly virus. And I think everybody wants that. Georgia Governor Brian Kemp, Thank you so much for taking time. I really appreciate it. You coming back? Be glad to come back. Go dogs. Listen to you. Go Razorbacks. <laughs>